بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أجمعين. It's always an honor to be here with all of you. Today I was tasked with the topic of radiance, reflecting radiance. And inshallah, there's a couple of stories and people that I want to kind of bring up in this particular conversation and also turn into our attention as women and as young ladies, mashallah, of what does that mean to reflect radiance. So shall we begin? Yeah, bismillah rahman rahim In thinking about radiance, one of the first people that came to mind... <laughs> I don't know what to do. I'll hold this one. How about that? One of the first people that came to mind for me, and there's so many, subhanAllah, because we know that anybody who is actively worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, actively reading the Quran, actively connected to the nur, the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is going to reflect radiance. So I'm going to tell you the story briefly of Imam Malik. Do you know the story of Imam Malik? It's a beautiful story. How does Imam Malik become Imam Malik? Someone said it. His mom. See, so many of the biographies of the greats of our scholars, if you read into their biography, who exactly had helped them, promoted them, continued, pushed them, it's almost always the mom. And I say this to a group of many moms in the room or future to be moms one day, or if it's not biological children, then it's spiritual children and mentorship that you give to so many and you're nurturing as a woman. Imam Malik, radiallahu anhu, came to his mom and said to her, came to his parents and said to them, I want to become a singer. Did you know this? <laughs> the great Imam Malik who we today honor and cherish, and we quote and we love. And an entire school of Islamic law is based on his wisdoms, subhanAllah. He came to his mom when he was young and said, I want to go into singing entertainment. <laughs> and she said some really wise advice to him. She said, as you get older, your voice will change. Your face will change. And what they love you for now, this beautiful face and this beautiful voice, when you are older, they will mean nothing. Any fame and any... This one too? <laughs> Alhamdulillah. It's like we have had a long day. Yalla, khalas Irania, finish. Alhamdulillah. Any fame and any glory that you will be given when you're young will fade. But if you channel that energy into studying, you will become more honored. And so he thought about this and decided that maybe his mom is actually right. And Imam Malik was heavily criticized for his appearance. Does anyone know why? What is it? What, what is it? Ah, yes. MashaAllah. Imam Malik loved to wear beautiful clothing. But he was not arrogant, nor was this ostentatious. He loved, and he would quote the hadith of the Prophet wasallam, that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you wealth, material wealth, then he loves that it shows on his ibad, on his servant. But you don't do this from a place of arrogance. You do this from a place of understanding your standing in the world. And what was Imam Malik standing? Imam Malik was somebody who all the kings and all the greats consulted. They would visit him. They would have, they, instead of him going to their courts, they would come to him. That's how important he was. And so you can imagine, if you're going to be sitting and advising people, you're going to sit with dignity. Before I tell you why I'm telling you the story, let me tell you one more thing about Imam Malik. When he would wear this beautiful clothing, and it said he would also wear very expensive musk, right? He would smell good. 
it said that often people would say, this must be in conflict with piety. How do you have somebody who's pious, who worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala daily and focuses so much on Islamic learning, yet is, he has his beautiful clothing, he would change his clothing, often they were like pristine white, right, and musk, right, mashallah. Why is he so interested in this outward form? And it goes back to his mother. When he was a little boy, a young boy, deciding to go to now study the deen, he would say to her, is it time for me to go write my lessons? And she would say, come here. And she would literally put on him scholar's clothing. Remember, he's a little kid. And she would tie his turban for him because he didn't know how to tie his own turban yet. And then she would say to him, come here and put scholar's clothing on and then go write. And so it connected for him that if somebody is going to be a person of scholarly tradition and somebody who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them either wealth or knowledge, that it should show on them. This concept, <laughs> subhanAllah, is important because many people would criticize Ibn Malik and say, what is his concern with the outward form? But in reality, we have this very funny idea that if you're somebody who is pious, if you're somebody who is dedicated to Islam, not arrogant, then you shouldn't care about what you look like. But that's simply not the tradition of the Prophet wasallam, nor the tradition of many of the greats, I won't say all, but many, who understood that actually you did have to make sure that you can carry this, he would say, the hadith of the Prophet, he would say, this is when people criticize him, he would specifically say, the dignity of the hadith of the Prophet demands that I look this way, that I look honorable, because I am carrying the honor of this deen. And I'm working with and explaining to people this deen. How are they going to take it honorably, especially if they're people of the, quote, dunya, the people of the dunya only speak language of the people of the dunya. <laughs> and so, our teachers would tell us, if you're going to make some headway in the da'wah of Islam, and this ex explaining, teaching, and propagating of Islam, you have to be able to speak the lingo of the people of the dunya. And Imam Malik understood this. Now, all of this story is to say, when we focus on the topic of radiance, people immediately think beauty. When they think beauty, they think outward beauty. And I just gave an entire explanation as to why outward beauty is important. But it's not the kind of beauty that we talk about in conventional wisdom. And in fact, conventional wisdom today just does not count anymore. There's a lot of young people here, but also all aged people here, and I'm sure you're on various social media platforms, as I am as well, and the trends, the many, many, many trends that we see. One thing that we talk about in our girls' halakas here at Rahma is how incredibly fickle beauty is. The concept of beauty, what does fickle mean? Come on, girls, what does fickle mean? Yeah, it changes. One day it's like this, one day it's like that. If you roll back enough into history, what today is trending was once trending in the 70s. <laughs> and then it goes out, and what's trending is trending now, what used to be the 60s. And then that goes out. And what trends again is trending, right? And it just keeps on changing. And the majority of the time, who is setting the beauty, outward beauty standards? It's often men in a corporate office somewhere who decide the year before what color is going to be the color of the season that everybody buys their purses and clothes according to that. Beauty is fickle, the outer beauty. But if we want to talk about the true inner beauty, the radiance that Islam brings, I want to tell you a story of a friend of mine. I'm not a dermatologist, but she is, and a very successful one, mashallah. <laughs> Somebody who's a skin doctor, right? And when I was growing up, she was in my community, and she was a hafid of the Qur'an. Mashallah. And she was one of the first of the girls from my community to go to Syria and study. And she came back and had memorized the Quran and went off to medical school and became a dermatologist. 
When I was in high school, I shadowed her. Shadowed her clinic, she's a bit older than me, so I was shadowing her as I was learning and trying to figure out what kind of medicine that I want to do, knowing that I too wanted to become a doctor one day. So I shadowed her a few times in her dermatology clinic, and one day she said to non-Muslim patients that she was working with, and unapologetic, <laughs> unapologetic Muslim, mashallah, she said to them, she said, Muslims have the best skin. <laughs> It's like, wow, mashallah. <laughs> and then she backed it up, and she said, and you know why we have the best skin? I'm thinking, oh my goodness, these patients of hers, you know. <laughs> and she said, we have the best skin. Do you know why? Because we wash our faces five times a day. Dear sisters, it's not a judgment, but I'm just saying, the stuff you cake on, that stuff that's caked on, isn't allowing the radiance of what you otherwise have as a mu'min, as a believer, to come through. And it certainly prevents the water, <laughs> okay? And some of it legit says waterproof. Come on now, mashallah. Come on. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> I'm going to move this before I like knock it away. Mashallah. <laughs> I get very agitated about these things, especially when it comes to fiqh. You know this. I'm like, come on. You're going to really risk your prayers, risk your prayers by it not counting because the wudu didn't count, because of the stuff that was caked on didn't actually allow the water through. And in addition to this, and look, we counsel. I'm, counsel. I'm in the counseling field. And I know there's a lot of question on self-confidence that people have. And a lot of the times, the reason that stuff is on there is because of self-confidence. Let me tell you, the number of women that I've met in my life, sheikhat, amazing women, scholars, who by beauty standards, outward beauty standards, would not be considered beautiful. They wouldn't. They're not like a model beautiful. But you know what shines through? You know what radiance is reflected through? <laughs> it's a nur. Literally, it is light. They're glowing. You look at them and you wouldn't say, nope, not, not, not model beauty, but the kind of beauty in which the nur, that light, comes through. And when you sit with them, you feel a sense of serenity and calm. You feel a person who isn't all tribulation inside of them. You feel a person who stands before their Lord at night and makes that dua and prays. And so they're holding on to the rope of Allah and the rope of Islam, and nothing shakes them. Or if they are shaken, like our teachers would say, when the hurricane comes through, they would say, be a palm tree. Have you ever seen a palm tree in a hurricane? Have you? I know we don't have a lot of them up in this area. We have earthquakes. What happens to a palm tree in an earthquake? Yes. What does it do? It'll bend this way, and it'll bend that way, and it'll toss and toss, but what will not happen to the palm tree? It will not come loose. Why? Why? Because of its root systems. A palm tree's roots are deep, 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 deep down and it's years of building. So it'll sway when a hurricane comes around, but it will not be uprooted. As they would tell us, be like the palm tree, as a believer. And so when you sit with these women of nur, of light, you find that they are incredibly vibrant. You find that they're connected. They're pulsating, right, literally. It's coming through. And what is they reflecting? What is the radiance that they're reflecting? It's the radiance of Iman. The radiance of belief, the radiance of prayer, the radiance of dua, the radiance of Qur'an. Qur'an, the whole Qur'an is nur, it's light. So imagine, if you even have just one surah memorized, which all of us have more than one here, I'm sure, because we all know, at least know Fatiha. If you have at least one memorized, that is nur living within you. You are literally the vessel carrying light. And that light is reflected on you. And so when people meet you, they may not be able to tell what's special about you, but they know something is different. And oftentimes people think, oh, it's the hijab you're wearing. <laughs> Maybe that's what's different. <laughs> you know? But it's not. 
It's more than that. And when they talk with you, they find themselves able to actually like have a sense of calm just by talking to you. What is that? It's not you. It's not me. It's not us. It's wallahi. It's not our work. It's literally the light of Allah coming through the Quran, coming through the very beings that we have as we're reading and as we're reciting and holding on to this Quran. Which is why we have to talk about nurturing our inner selves. I joke a lot, my halakha folks know, I joke a lot about people and their skin routines. And you should have them. Oh, no, I'm not saying that you don't. <laughs> right? But I tell this funny story of one time I was, you know, may Allah forgive me, but I only tell the story because of this, uh, how, 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 how much I was caught off guard by the story. But anyway, it was one time I was, I never go up necessarily to the floor up where it has all the administrative offices, but I had to drop something off. So I dropped off something at this office and the person working there had never met. And I was just literally just at the doorway and I said, oh, I'm here to drop these papers off. <laughs> and literally she turned like this. She was in one of the wheelie chairs and she kind of turned like this and she goes, What's your skin routine? <laughs> I was just caught off guard, like, you know, and if I had one, you know, I'd be happy to offer it. <laughs> you know? And I was like, what? <laughs> and she repeated the question again. And I was like, yeah, literally three times. And so, <laughs> and so finally, you know, I said, no, really, I don't. She's like, no, no, tell me your secret. Come on, I know what's a secret. Women have their secrets. Come on. You know, <laughs> well, inshallah. Literally, I probably should have said to her, repeat after me. <laughs> and then I reflected on this because I walked, I was kind of like, huh, you know, as I left the, and I just kept thinking about this and thinking, and I thought, what is going on here? And I thought, subhanAllah, even a person who's not Muslim, who does not understand necessarily or know what we mean by the radiance of Qur'an or of Salah or of Wudu, who knows what that was? Allahu alam. Who knows? Right? But I mean to say, it was something that was picked up by others. And even if you don't recognize it, it's happening. Right? And you sometimes do see people or sometimes even yourselves, often yourselves, and you can't even tell, but others can. We believe in the aura, like in a vibe, an energy that is given off by Iman. And it's tangible, and it's something you feel. And the presence of angels, and the presence of the very thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said and taught us in the Qur'an, سِيمَاهُمْ fi wujuhihim, min أَثَرٍ sujud. Literally, you can see it on their faces. The traces of it are on their faces from their prostration. It's in the Qur'an. I'm not making it up. Allah describes it directly, right? And so when we think about what, how, how do you get to this point, there's a certain level of nurturing your inner self, of purifying your inner reality, that that glow isn't going to get there on its own, and it's not going to get there as much as you rub stuff on it. <laughs> Inshallah, alhamdulillah, the, the outer layer may be, but the inner glow isn't going to come until there's faith, niya, intentions, thoughts, actions, motives. Everything we do starts to become for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when it appears on your face, it literally is the sign of the righteous. And look, in the tafsir, by the way, that ayah that I just said, سِيمَاهُمْ فِي وَجُوهِهِمْ some people, and this is not me talking, this is Imam al-Qurtubi in the tafsir says, some people interpret this verse and think that it's an outer mark. So they purposefully like, you know, press their foreheads in or do whatever they do to get this like gnarly thing on their face. <laughs> yeah, I got myself in trouble a lot. Um, Imam al-Qurtubi talking, not me. He says, some of the juhal, those who are ignorant of the meaning of the verse, believe that it's an outer mark, but actually it's an inner. It's an inner manifestation. Oop, I'm excited again. Inner manifestation of that nur. Does that make sense? Really important that we understand our deen. So this salah, this prayer that we do, these prostrations that we make, they are literally illumination. They illuminate you. They give you a radiance. And you are reflecting not your own work, but rather the radiance, the nur of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And in particular, I want to tell you about, you know, we, I was reminding our halakai last night that we are exactly sisters. How, how far out are we from Ramadan? Exactly one month. Last Friday, so Aid was on a Friday. Last fr yesterday, which was Friday, right? Four Fridays ago was the last day of Ramadan. Aid, Yani. Right? You're a month out. So my question to all of you, how is your prayer? How is your Qur'an? How is your extra nafil and ibadah and charitable acts one month out of Ramadan? How are we doing? How are we doing? Let's just be real. How are we doing? Good. It's good to be honest. Wallahi, transparency and honesty is the most important thing. My halakha knows every Friday of the last four Fridays, I have been insisting that people take out their phones, open up their calendar, and literally put in the app, or wherever you write your calendar, uh, um, Qur'an. Let it pop up as a notification of, it's time for me to read Qur'an. <laughs> because I know my schedule, right? When I open up this app, it's very colorful, alhamdulillah. alhamdulillah. But if it does not say, read now, Rania, I may lose track of reading that day. Does that make sense? As much as we think it's a habit and I got this, I got this, yeah, I got this, right? The reality is life is chaotic. There's just a lot of stuff going on. And so you need to make sure that you actually pin yourself to it and then you hold yourself to account. If it's not daily, then it should be every few days. If it's not every few days, then at least once a week, right? There's got to be anchors to this. And if you're listening to this and you're saying, alhamdulillah, I've got this, alhamdulillah, prayers are good, you know, I'm able to do my nafil, I'm able to actually read some Qur'an. Can we talk about the next thing? Can we talk about the next thing? Like the next level? And even if you feel like that's too far, <laughs> it's okay. Our teachers tell us and remind us, you need to know what the bar is, not where you drink. <laughs> but, the <laughs> the, 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 you know, what you need to reach to. Because if you don't set the bar high enough, you're keeping it pretty low. And you're like, I'm good, I'm good, all's good, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, how you doing, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. who knows what that means, right? Who knows what that means? <laughs> but if you know what the bar is, then you know that you're still striving to get there. So they would tell us the bar in terms of simahum fi wujuhihim, right? If you want that radiance, the bar that our teacher set for us, which is a hard one, but we learn it directly from the Prophet wasallam, is tahajjud. It's the extra night prayers. Now, let me tell you another story of another individual in our history who is definitely one of the most radiant women. There's two that I'll mention today, but one that I'll start with. When we think of extra worship and extra prayers and extra connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sometimes people think of men and male worship. But I want to focus you back in that in our tradition, there is this beautiful poem written about a woman Abida, servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, worshiper of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that they say that her ibadah, her worship, outworshipped a thousand men. Who am I talking about? Rabia al Adawiya. Rabia is beautiful, subhanAllah. This is a pre Rumi, okay? Inshallah. And she's her 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 literally her du'as are captured as poetry. SubhanAllah, how beautiful her munajat, her, 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 her kind of pleading and begging back and forth with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I'm going to read one to you. And it says, O oh God and my Lord, eyes are at rest and stars are setting. Hushed are the stirrings of the birds in their nests or the monsters in the oceans. You are the just who knows no change, the balance that can never swerve, the eternal that never passes away. The doors of kings are bolted now and guarded by your soldiers. But your door is open to all you, all who call upon you. My Lord, each love is now alone with his beloved. And I am alone with you. That last line especially, that every person, think about this, one is Tehashud. Three in the morning, four in the morning, middle of the, literally middle of the night. 
she would say, almost everyone is asleep. Everyone is in the arms of their beloved. And I, Ya Allah, am awake in your arms. That level of connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when everything else is quiet and still, getting out of the warmth of one's bed is hard. It's hard. It's hard. I'm, I'm not going to try to <laughs> rose color it any other way. But what does it do for you? If you want to know what the bar is, right? it's to understand that if you want the radiance, you want to be able to reflect that luminosity. And we'll tell you why in a moment here. That it comes down to never missing your fard salah, your prayers, especially the obligations. And if you're good with that, to add the nawafil. And if you're good with that, try to add the extra of the night prayers or these tahajjud prayers. Because the power of the light that they give, the reflection of the radiance that something like tahajjud gives, literally it is the kind of powerful light. It's like, you know, um, Yesterday, I was telling the students at the conference, Sheikh al-Sha'rawi, rahimahullah, was a really beautiful Egyptian um, uh, mufassir of the Qur'an, somebody who explained the verses of the Qur'an, and he was also a linguist, so he really understood the meanings of the Qur'an so beautifully. And he had this really beautiful saying, where he would say that all of humanity was in darkness. And so they tried to figure out how to light up the place. He said some humans came to it by figuring out how to do, right, let up a match, a little match, a little bit of light, right? In the darkness, a little bit of light. Someone got smart and said, let's put the match on top of a candle. Oh, okay, now we have it's lasting a little longer, but it's still a little light. Someone said, let's take multiple candles and put them around on a chandelier. Someone said, let's put it all together and make a torch, right? The next person comes around sometime later and figures out the light bulb. Then someone says, put multiple light bulbs. Until you get all the way to where humans are striving, they're trying, they're trying to put light forward, until they built the most powerful lights there are. Have you ever been in a stadium at night? Watched a game at night? When you're in the stadium, I played sports, so <laughs> when you're in the stadium at night, it is bright. It's as though it was literally the middle of the day. That's how bright it is. Bright, bright, bright light. And the point Sheikh Sharawi was trying to make is, but when the sun comes up in the morning the next day, you literally have to squint to see whether those stadium lights are still on or not. And he would say, what the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, brought was like the sun compared to what all humans have attempted to put forward even in those bright stadium lights. Does that make sense? That bright light, if you want the brightest of the lights, if you literally want the nur, it's going to come from things like the Qur'an and the prayers, and especially the tahajjuds. Why? Why am I pushing this as much as we can? Because I want to tell you this hadith. The Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, It's a heavy one, but it's a really beautiful one. He said, verily, my nation will be called on the day of judgment. So imagine, just take a moment, put yourself in these shoes. It's going to come. We believe as believers, we know it's coming. But sometimes we don't think about actually putting ourselves in the shoes of what would it be like that day. So just take a moment with me. It's the day of resurrection. Yom al-Qiyamah is happening. You all heard, as I heard, the stories of the chaos. The people running and screaming and shrieking and, you know, having a really hard time because the truth has come. And there's no turning back. And he says, verily, my nation will be called on the day of judgment. And they will be identified how will you, in, 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 in millions, of million, billion, billions of people, how are we going to be identified as Ummat Muhammad? He says, we will be identified by the traces of the radiance. Speaking of reflecting radiance. The traces of the radiance from what? From the wudu. Every place that wudu touched your body, 
the face, the hands and arms, the feet, the head, everywhere that would do touched, imagine. Can you imagine, have you ever been to somewhere where it's like a glow in the dark or something that's a glow in the dark? Can you imagine being glowing in the dark? <laughs> glow in the dark. <laughs> I want to glow in the dark. I don't know about you on the day of judgment, mashallah, to be like, yep, that one's from Ummah Muhammad, alhamdulillah. Right, alhamdulillah. <laughs> I'm being very serious. This is directly from the hadith of the Prophet wasallam. He says they will be identified by the brightly radiant traces from the wudu. Whoever among you is able to extend this radiance, then let them do so. I'm just going to let that sink in for a minute. When we start talking as reflecting radiance, my dear sisters, I'm not talking about, oh, wow, you're glowing. Are you pregnant? Right? <laughs> <laughs> and yes, pregnancy does bring a glow to it. But I'm talking about a kind of glow that literally is seen, if not here, and if not by the people here, is seen where it's more important. And it's identifiable and identifying you on a day that otherwise is chaotic. And on that day that you want to be identified from Ummah to Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So in closing and really kind of wrapping this up, remember... Nur, this nur that we talk about, is a light or a glow. And when people look at you, they should see kind of a refreshing, vibrant radiance that comes from what? Our faith, our intentions, our niyyah. Wallahi, even the niyyah, even the intention will give you nur, even if you don't completely follow through, or you were prevented from it, or you couldn't follow through on the intention you made. You're rewarded even for the intention. And then, of course, our behaviors, our thoughts, our actions, and our motives. And that one of the signs of the people who are righteous is being at peace, having a good attitude, and having contentment. The last person I'm going to share with you, who truly, her name literally is the Radiant. Who is the Radiant? Who is it? Fatima Zahra. What does Zahra mean? See, everybody says flower. Ah, she's literally called Fatima the Radiant. And Fatima, radiallahu anha, of course, the youngest of the daughters of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the only one who outlives him, but dies very soon after him. It is the mother, of course, of the grandchildren of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And lives a very pious, pious, humble life because neither she or her husband, who is whom? Sayyidina Ali, karamallahu wajhahu, even he, we say, may Allah ennoble his face. Can you imagine <laughs> the ennobled face and the radiant face? MashaAllah, what an amazing couple. That's a barakallah. And here you have somebody who is, has a difficult life because they were both poor. And difficult, so much so that one day Sayyidina Ali said to her, can you ask your father for some help? Your father is the prophet of God. Like, ask him to uh, help us. They have four children, and she was, they were poor. He had to sell his shield, literally, to have enough mahar to pay for her dowry. And so she went to her father. She didn't find him there, so she left the message with Sittana Aisha, radiallahu anha. And that night, the Prophet ﷺ came to her and said, you came to look for me. And she said, yes, I'm asking for help. What did he say to her? Does anyone know? Huh? What did he teach her? He said, in, he said, if you want, I can get you help. But if you want, I can teach you something that's better than this. And what was that? Say, say it together. SubhanAllah. Alhamdulillah. La ilaha illallah. Allahu Akbar. And he taught her to say this. And in teaching her this, what was he teaching? Because it wasn't just teaching her. He was teaching all of us by extension. And this doesn't mean, by the way, you can't get help. That's not the, the, that's not the moral of the story. Some people take that and say, oh, I've got to be super and I've got to do this all alone. That's not the point of the story. The point of the story is to be content, to be patient, to work through it. Because what the Prophet is teaching, he's using his daughter realizing that she will be the example. She's, she's from the exemplars, right? The women who are guaranteed paradise. And there are so many women of this, in this globe, on this globe, who are never going to have, my dear sisters, 
I know you all come from different communities and walks of life, but we all collectively have what most women in this, on this globe do not have and cannot access. Do you hear me? So when the Prophet says, can I teach you these words, it's because there will be the millions of Muslim women who can't access extra help. And how will they remain steadfast and content? SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar. But like the original story I started off with, Imam Malik, if Allah's giving you wealth, then use it. Alhamdulillah, Allah wants to see that goodness on you. But if he hasn't given that to you, and that's part of your trials, your trials, then there's other ways to hold on to contentment as well. Do you hear what I'm trying to say? This deen is for everybody, so therefore it has to have flexibility for all times and all places and all people, right? And so, back to what we were saying of Satina Fatima Zahra, part of this is knowing that by nurturing that inner self, you're going to also be able to glow externally. And even if it does not show to the people around you or you can't see it when you look in the mirror, know that the angels have witnessed it. And know that when the day when it matters, when you want to be identified as part of the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that that radiance and luminosity comes through. That's what we're hoping for, Wallahi. So my dear sisters, and I'm speaking to all our young ones and to all, actually everybody here, please. The hadith clearly says, if you have the ability to extend it, then let them do What is he referring to? Make sure that the wudu is full. Look, as a fiqh teacher, <laughs> now people are not going to ever want to make wudu in front of me. <laughs> I hold my tongue. I don't know you, so I won't say anything. But if I know you, or if you've been in my halakha for some time, and I walk in and you're making wudu next to me and you're going like this, I will tell you, sister, unpin your hijab, allow that water to get all the way through to the entire extent of the face, to the entire extent of the elbows. Make sure the feet are fully washed. Allow the light to shine in the dunya and in the akhirah. The splashes and the quick wipes aren't going to give you the kind of luminosity that we, we need. Did I hurt your feelings? Alhamdulillah. <laughs> I love her. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. And so I'm going to end here, inshallah, by telling you that the Prophet Muhammad, by a hadith of the Prophet, وسلم, where he said, In paradise, there is a street in which they, could come every, they would come every Friday. And the north wind would blow and it would scatter fragrance on their faces and on their clothes and would add beauty and loveliness. <laughs> That's what it says. And then they would go back to their families after having added their, this beauty and loveliness to themselves. And their family would say to them, by Allah, you have been increased in beauty and loveliness after leaving us. And they would say, by Allah, you have also increased in beauty and loveliness after us. SubhanAllah. The, the point of this hadith here is to think about how this idea of Jannah, that in Jannah, all of it, is literally light, is nur. And if you feel the sense of darkness here right now, in this life that you're living, there's constriction, there's tightness, there's difficulty, there's dark corners. As a believer, know that there is everlasting, ever-ending, never-ending light that's coming forward. I hope, inshallah, you and I can find that kind of light in this dunya too. But if it's hard to find or there's moments or stages or years of your life in which are difficult to find that light, know that the light is coming forever after this, inshallah ta'ala. And that helps the believer breathe, <laughs> knowing that what's to come is greater and bigger and that Allah in his vastness, in his vastness, won't ever leave us alone. InshaAllah. And with that, we'll close. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahum ala al-hadi Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam ajma'een. I ask Ya Rabbil Alameen that you please, Ya Allah, allow us to be women of radiance. Women, Ya Rabbi, who glow from the inside out. Ya Rabbi, whose 
insides match their outsides and their outsides match their insides. Ya Rabbi, we ask you to be people who are steadfast on this deen. Ya Rabbi, allow us to have the kind of light on our faces from the traces of our wudu and our prayers, Ya Kareem. Allow us to try to be people of tahajjud to stand between your hands alone when all others are sleeping. Ya Rabbi, to experience that sweetness of faith so we are never, ever shaken. Ya Rabbi, like the palm tree, it may sway, but it's never uprooted. Ya Rabbi, we ask you, Ya Kareem, to please bless us, increase us, empower us, uplift us. Ya Rabbi, we ask you to love us because we love you, Ya Kareem, and allow that love to enter into our hearts fully and completely and the love of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and to be able to give that love and the knowledge of this deen to our progeny, Ya Kareem, that our great, great, great grandchildren in this country still call themselves Muslimin. يا رب العالمين والحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على الهادي محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أجمعين آمين